Dear Chair of the Board of uh, Nokia Board of Directors, dear honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 27th annual award ceremony of the Nokia Foundation. My name is Hannu Kauppinen. I'm the chair of the board of Nokia Foundation and the CTO of Nokia Technologies. It is my pleasure to host this evening's ceremony for you, and I am delighted to see so many of you here again in person. In a moment, I will hand over to Tommy Uitto, the president of uh, Nokia Mobile Networks, who will deliver, deliver a keynote speech on Nokia's technology vision and our priorities in our Finnish R&D. But before that, let me just quickly take you through the agenda for this evening. First, I will introduce the Nokia Foundation mission and its activities today. Then, after we had heard from Tommy, we will present this year's scholarship and grant receivers, and I have invited one of them, the winner of the Millennium Graduate Student Contest, to pitch his research project to us. Then, Sari Baldauf, chair of the Nokia Board of Directors, will announce the recipient of the 27th Nokia Foundation Recognition Award. We will then hear a speech by the winner of the Recognition Award. And during the program, we will also hear music from two saxophonists, Jonathan Rautil and Max Zenger. So let me start by saying a few words about the Foundation. The Nokia Foundation uh, was uh, established in 1995 to promote and sponsor scientific research and education in the field of information and communication technologies in Finland. The Foundation carries out its mission by providing scholarships, grants and awards to support this work and publishing the results of the research. Currently, the Nokia Foundation pursues its mission through the following five programs. Sorry, uh, okay. Nokia Scholarship Program. Uh, first, we have the Nokia Scholarship Program. Grants in this program are awarded to individuals who are pursuing their doctoral uh, degrees in ICT or in supporting scientific disciplines. Secondly, the Jorma Ollila Fund and the program. Grants in this program are directed to recently graduated doctors looking to further develop their research career through international experience. The Visiting Professor program enables distinguished foreign professors to work in Finland or Finnish professors to work at respected foreign universities. The fourth one is our Fulbright Nokia Distinguished Chair program. It's a unique opportunity for American scholars to engage in research collaboration at the Finnish university. And the France Nokia Distinguished Chair program launched this year in collaboration with the Institut Francais de Finlande, in which we invite a French scientist to visit a Finnish university. And finally, today, for the 27th time, we will announce our annual Nokia Foundation Recognition Award, which celebrates individuals who have made a significant and lasting contribution to the advancement of ICT in Finland. Since its inception in 1995, the Nokia Foundation has granted over 1,900 scholarships, grants and awards, which, re which represents more than 10 million euros in value.
At my daily work in Nokia, I see the impact of technology research. A concrete example is Nokia's real-time extended reality multimedia solution, which we were demonstrating at the reception just a moment ago. By using a virtual reality headset or just a normal smartphone, you can experience an immersive 360-degree video and voice from another location in real time. This solution has many benefits. For example, mining equipment can be remotely operated by a person from a safe control room. instead of a dangerous underground environment. Or inspection or maintenance of a nuclear power plant or an aircraft can be carried out remotely by experts from overseas, reducing the need of international travel. Today, this bright and colorful video image is delivered to you and many simultaneous viewers in one-tenth of a second at the power consumption of a few watts. Over the years, our team has made a staggering hundredfold improvement in both latency and energy efficiency. With the help of a few breakthrough ideas and many smaller ones. We also contributed the technology to open standards which helps to create an ecosystem where many players can build their hardware and software solutions without having to take the R&D risk alone. Real-time extended reality is a step towards the metaverse. It's an early step towards the metaverse. In the industry, our role is to set the vision and the goal to research. What are the requirements for 6G mobile networks and the metaverse? We will hear more about this from Tommy in a moment. Academic research provides us with the solutions to the fundamental problems that will bring the hundredfold improvement and sometimes open new fields of research. Today, we will be awarding many young doctoral students and postdoctoral researchers. And I am proud of the role that the Nokia Foundation plays in promoting contact between researchers and Finnish companies, including the Nokia Corporation. It's a win win win, providing technology an idea transfer from fundamental academic research to industrial R&D, career opportunities for recently graduated PhDs, and access to new talent for Finnish companies. Skills in mathematics and natural sciences lay a strong foundation for technological research and development. And before one can pursue doctoral level studies, one must already have a solid basis in the fundamental sciences and a motivation to pursue a career in a field of technology. Which is why supporting education in ICT is also an important part of Nokia Foundation's mission. We will come back to this theme later. Before we hear the keynote, let's watch a short video on Nokia's technology vision 2030. By 2030, the world as we know it will be dramatically transformed. The metaverse will open up endless opportunities across consumer, enterprise and industrial sectors. Digital physical fusion and human augmentation will transform how people interact in a combined physical and digital reality. 
none of this will be possible without the network. It will need to become more intelligent, dynamic, scalable, and secure, evolving to enable a rich multi-party value ecosystem that will unleash innovation and opportunity, creating sustainable solutions for some of the world's biggest challenges, all made possible through Nokia's innovations. This is our vision for 2030. Together, we're creating the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Wow, it's a, it's a privilege to be uh, delivering a keynote to so many intelligent, highly educated and sophisticated and beautiful people. Uh, Dr. Barrickvist once said that, uh, Tommy, in every important speech there should be uh, a thank you, there should be something uplifting, and there should be something funny. I tried to cover the funny part with the previous sentence. <laughs> Actually, to deliver a keynote feels also very good from the standpoint that uh, during these times of supply constraints, when you can deliver something, it feels particularly good. <laughs> now, before the, before the keynote, on our technology vision, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, uh, congratulate all the Nokia scholarship and uh, Jorma Olila grant recipients. Indeed, like Hannu said, we have gathered here today to, to celebrate your, your achievements, and I'm very much looking forward personally to, to see and hear. So, I will be sharing the, the technology vision 2030, which we recently updated and which premiered in, in New York City about, uh, about a month ago. Uh, and where the metaverse, both in consumer, uh, enterprise and industrial, will be in, in the key role. But what is also clear to us that for us to contribute to making metaverse happen, we, even if we have formidable technology assets and capabilities, we will not be able to do this alone. It is clear that we need partners, we need collaboration, uh, partnerships with universities, uh, as well as technology institutes, all the possible ecosystem with high-tech companies around the world, including in Finland. So, privileged to, to talk to you today and share uh, our technology vision 2030. So, let's start by looking at the, some of the key trends of what will uh, impact the world before we get to 2030 and what would enable uh, the kind of world that we will see in, in 2030. On the left-hand side, you can see some socio-economic and geopolitical forces and how they will be impacting us going forward. Deglobalization, very obvious. There's regionalization of research, regionalization of manufacturing, purchasing, uh, collaboration. There's state-driven innovation. Different governments, uh, different coalitions of governments taking a bigger role in steering research and innovation. European Union talking about technological sovereignty, uh, the CHIPS Act in the US, and, and similar. Cybersecurity, obviously, if the humankind is more and more dependent on data and the nerve system of humanity being the networks, we will need even more of cybersecurity than what we know today. And last, sustainability, I need to say no more. Looking at the right-hand side, you have the user needs. Uh, we have users by that time, some of whom are still small children or may not even have born yet. We need to deliver evolved experiences. It is not just about hearing. Today's communication is still very much about, you can say, one-dimensional point-to-point -point connection. Even a video is just two-dimensional. It will have to be about three-dimensional experience, audio, video, even haptic and tactile experience of how we consume data and impact the world around us. You have digital first, because in many businesses, in many products, in many services, the first way to approach matters is to deliver digital first, and only then consider physical, or physical may be coming afterwards or be an option. And obviously, connectivity can no longer be one size fits all. Connectivity will have to be optimized per service, for the service level required by the different services uh, that are enabled and uh, made happen in, in the metaverse. New purchasing priorities will, of course, 
uh, be impacted by some of the socio-economical and geopolitical aspects, uh, there will be, of course, increased emphasis on uh, sustainability, uh, CO2 emissions, but also some of, the, some of the buyers of our products and services will come from a generation that may have very different priorities than what you and I have today. In the middle, you then see some of the technologies that are between the pressure of the two, on the left and right, created by them, enabled by them, or impacted by them, so that in 2030, we expect them to see not just 5G as a mobile generation or mobile technology, and 6G, um, human augmentation with extended reality. Hu machines don't need uh, augmentation. They can understand just from data, but we need to see feel and here we need that human augmentation not just linear software but a learning machine blockchain web3 and cloud computing technologies immersive across the entire computing sphere so in our technology vision 2030 metaverse is in a in a in a, in a key focus uh, and of course, it is clear that uh, companies like Meta have been talking about metaverse for quite some time, and their focus is very much in the consumer metaverse. It's about how to make people's lives somehow more enjoyable, safer, more productive, uh, uh, all the right things from the consumer or individual business person perspective, if you will. But if that's the case, then it is obvious and it's conceivable that there will be use cases in the enterprise space, where enterprise can benefit in their own products and services, in their own business processes, from using uh, metaverse, uh, digital rep representation, the, the digital twin, uh, with all the bells and whistles uh, that entailed. And as a special case, we pick industrial metaverse out of uh, enterprise metaverse as a sub subset, because of the fact that, um, well, just look at today. Today, we see tremendous growth in private wireless networks. That part of our business is growing by 35% per year versus just the 2% per year on the traditional operator spending. And the reason is that private wireless networks are helping some of those industries to improve their productivity, whose productivity has been lagging behind for the past decades. If in other industries, productivity gains have been an average of 3% per year, in some industries, Productivity has been only 1% or less than 1% per year CAGR since the last, uh, during the last decades. And these are typically industries where something is moving, something is controlled, something is, is handled, something, something expensive or dangerous or something that needs to be located very specifically in space as a function of time. And there just hasn't been any proper wireless IoT technology to do that before. But once that is possible, and once, once we enable metaverse, it is obvious that there are use cases that will improve the productivity and the business in various industries. But to do that, we need, we need two enablers. We need the digital physical fusion. We obviously need to have, in the beginning, some sort of local digital twinning, basic digital twinning. But that will, over time, by 2030 and in the subsequent decade, evolve to a direction where you will have enterprise-wide global digital twins, and digital twins that will, will be able to col collaborate with each other, other sort of federated, federated uh, 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 digital twins, if you will. And as I said, machines don't really need this, but we people, we need human augmentation. So we will need uh, XR glasses, XR devices, in the beginning tethered, but later even untethered, that will enable us to see the digital twin hear it, understand it, and even interact it, even feel it with tactile and haptic technologies. Now, my engineers are asking me, so what? What do we need to do? And this is where Nokia Bell Labs uh, is helping us, and they are starting to translate this to what are the network requirements? What do we need to do to the radio networks and to the core networks, to the optical networks? What are the kind of performance characteristics that we will need to deliver in order to enable metaverse? And I'm quite proud about how far we are with this because, because we, we recently discussed with Meta, they had actually a very simple, simple um, 
a rule of thumb, 25 megabits per second in downlink and uplink, ubiquitous, both 3GPP, cellular and Wi-Fi everywhere. It's actually a pretty good uh, sort of simple summary. But in this, this spider chart, you can see the various network performance characteristics from the, from the peak rates, the average rates, energy efficiency, uh, density of devices, reliability, localization accuracy, or positioning accuracy, and, and latency, where we can then map the different use cases of metaverse to understand what we need to do to the network. Now, let's come to Finland, this uh, warm and sunny home country of ours. Uh, today I was hosting a Brazilian customer and he was just so happy to see snow. Uh, for us in Nokia, Finland, of course, plays a, a big role in making our technology vision 2030 happen for the part of Nokia. And uh, so Finland is a very R&D-centric and R&D-heavy country for us. So today in Finland we have 6,900 people, of which some 4,500 people work in research, standardization in 3GPP, as well as product development. And that is more than, of course, any other Finnish company has. Globally, our R&D investment was 4.1 billion euro last year. Uh, one indicator would be that Nokia generated more patent filings in Finland of any company, but also in European Patent Office in 21. Almost one third of all the Nokia patent filings have been made in Finland uh, in our global operation. But for this, we, we obviously will need new talent. And, uh, we have hired, uh, in the last four years, 2,500 people in Finland. We have actually not spoken much about it because some in media would like to say, yes, but, and then refer to some things that happened in the past. So we have not made much noise out of it, but uh, 2,500 people. Plus we have 500 trainees every year. And, uh, which, and, and we have, out of those 100 are thesis workers, uh, uh, either master level or, or, or even PhD. We still keep hiring, uh, especially system on chip developers, uh, and some also in, in the research, research area. But at the moment, there are of course not enough people in Finland alone, or sort of native Finns, people born in Finland to do that. It's, it's interesting that uh, in the last couple of years, some 50% of the people we have hired in Finland were not born in Finland. So they joined Nokia either straight from a, uh, a foreign country, or they worked for another Finnish company, or they graduated from a Finnish uh, university or school when they joined Nokia, but they were not born in Finland. 50%. And the technology industries of Finland has estimated that the technology sector will need 130,000 new employees in the sector by year 2030. And with this, it is just so difficult to understand, let alone accept those people and those politicians who are categorically against all work-related immigration. I even have some discussions with Finnish banks about how difficult it is to open bank accounts. And they hide behind money laundering uh, regulation. Uh, I'm, I'm asking them the question that uh, well, how do they do that in Canada and, and Estonia? Well, how is it possible to get bank accounts open fast there? So, um, as said, uh, we will need partners to make this all happen, uh, despite of our formidable technology assets and, and capabilities. So, collaboration with universities, research institutes, uh, all the other companies building a unique ecosystem. Um, the research areas that are vital for Nokia going forward will include, of course, 5G and 6G, that goes without saying, also edge computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and quantum technologies. Last summer, we donated to four Finnish universities, Aalto University, my alma mater, and the universities of Helsinki, Oulu, and Tampere, a total of 1.1 million euros to support research, education, and innovation. At the moment, there are several interesting ongoing projects, and I will mention a few. So, regarding our collaboration with uh, Aalto University, I'd like to highlight uh, the doctoral school in quantum technology. Uh, with University of Helsinki and Aalto University, we have the Nokia Center for Advanced Research to develop and explore radical new ideas and techniques for scalable, robust and efficient software for future networks and mobile solutions. With the University of Oulu, in collaboration with other universities, 
the focus is, is especially on the 6G flagship program. And again, we are very competitive in nature. And as a little challenge to everybody in the room, I will say that the University of Oulu has always been most active towards uh, Nokia mobile networks. In Tampere, we have the SOC hub project coordinated with Tampere University and Nokia. So that's about developing the system on chip, which is really the, the heart and the brain of the base station, without which nothing else would exist. Uh, then there are the Veturi initiatives. So Veturi is a business Finland concept and a competition uh, where companies are competing for certain funding in the way that there's a lead company, an engine, a locomotive that is pulling other smaller companies. And we have been uh, selected as the lead twice now uh, uh, for unlocking the industrial 5G, which is about private wireless networks with different industrial players to make the ecosystem in Finland for private wireless networks capable of competing uh, in the world market. And then competitive edge, what a nice uh, play of words, because it's about building competitive advantage in edge computing. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, to sum up, there are tremendous opportunities that we have together as we move towards 2030, whether academics, research institutes, engineers, product developers, researchers, those who support us. But we need to invest in research and innovation even more than today. We need strong collaboration. It is strong, but it could be even stronger. I have been in this job for four years. Only one university has approached me to say, what can we do for Nokia's mobile networks for you to be successful with your skilled workforce, with your intellectual property, with your innovations. We need to engage the best talent, both in Finland and get people from abroad with the brightest minds. We need to make immigration for students as well as work-related immigration smoother uh, for Finland to, to succeed, for Nokia to succeed, for Finnish tech companies to succeed, and for Finland and the humankind to succeed in 2030. Thank you very much. Okay, so data. We have more and more data available each day from a plethora of different fields, from industry to the public sector. But what, we do, what do we do with this data? We end up making decisions. And these decisions are a result of solving problems with multiple conflicting objectives with various trade-offs. Often, the most environmentally friendly option is not the most cost effective. Behind these decisions stands a decision maker with very vast domain expertise, which is often left untapped in decision support tools. How can we incorporate this expertise in the tools we use? How can we justify the decisions we make utilizing these tools? We need better decision support tools. But this is not enough. We need tools that we really understand how they work so that we can really justify the decisions we make. How can we convince shareholders to choose an option that is more envi environmentally friendly by sacrificing revenue? How can we justify this kind of a decision? What we need is explainability. Uh, explainability helps us understand what kind of decisions we make when we utilize tools that are explainable. And what I suggest is a new breed of decision support tools, which is based on explainable multi-objective optimization. Explainable multi-objective optimization enhances decision making. It doesn't replace human decision makers. It helps us incorporate preference information in the decision support tools we use, so that we can really leverage the knowledge of decision makers. Explainability enhances the knowledge of the decision maker by incorporating preference information and in the decision support to tools we use, and, and it helps us also understand how the tools work. This is critical. Uh, for example, sometimes a very small loss in revenue can lead to a huge gain in sustainability. Traditional su decision support tools can fail to communicate this. The beneficiaries of this new breed of decision support tools are domain experts from various fields and the industry, policymakers, stakeholders, and the general public. 
at the University of Jyväskylä, we at the Multi-Object Optimization Research Group are pioneers of advancing explainable multi-object optimization. We have applied our tools in the past to forest, Finnish forest management and healthcare, for instance. It is our mission to develop the next generation of explainable multi-object optimization decision support tools to the next level where they can be applied globally by researchers and practitioners alike. We develop our tools as openly available open source software promoting the openness and renewal of science. It is my personal mission to develop the next generation of human comprehensible and explainable decision support tools to help our society move towards a more sustainable, explainable and justifiable future. Thank you. So tonight we are actually honored to have with us the winners of the two previous years of our Nokia Recognition Award. So we're now moving on to the next part of the agenda, the Nokia Foundation Recognition Award. And, uh, and our two previous year's winners received their awards in our virtual ceremony last year and the year before. Let's give them a round of applause again, now in person, to Professor Mikko Möttönen, the winner of the Nokia Foundation Recognition Award in 2020 for his work in development of quantum computing. Mikko, congratulations again. And Professor Uryo Neuvo, winner of the Nokia Foundation Recognition Award in 2021 for his work in the development of postgraduate education. Uryo, congratulations once again. <laughs> and now I have the honor to ask Sari Baldauf, chair of the Nokia Board of Directors, to announce the recipient of the 27th Nokia Foundation Recognition Award. Sari, welcome on the stage. Thank you, Hannu. So, it is my real pleasure to announce that Nokia Foundation has granted the 2022 Recognition Award to Professor Maya Axela for her visionary and successful work to develop education in mathematics and uh, natural sciences. Knowledge and living interest in science and mathematics are the basis for technological development and innovation. Those are central to Finland's future prosperity and well-being. Teachers have a vital role to play in inspiring and enabling the next generation to pursue their studies in these fields. Maya Axela is Finland's first professor of science education. She has over 35 years of experience in developing teaching and teacher training in STEM subjects and new and inspiring teaching methods. She has published over 400 academic publications and supervised numerous doctoral dissertations and other theses. A notable example of Professor Axela's ideas in action is the LUMA Center at the University of Helsinki, which was established almost 20 years ago to promote the teaching and learning of mathematics and science. Today, the Luma Center Finland has grown into a network comprising 11 Finnish universities and 13 regional Luma centers with science and technology labs around the country. An impactful innovation, social innovation, built on collaboration and networked way of working. Maya serves as director of the network alongside of her other primary duties. Maya, my warmest congratulations and deep appreciation for your strong contribution to Finland's science and technology knowledge base. Let's give Professor Axela 
a big hand. So, congratulations. Do we take it? <laughs> you get yeah. in the middle. <laughs> okay. Dear the chair of Nokia board, Sari Baldau, chair of Nokia Foundation, uh, Hanno Kauppinen, honorary quests, all ladies and gentlemen, and all beautiful makers of future. <laughs> it's uh, my pleasure and honor today to share our Luma work with you. First of all, warm thanks for this great award. In addition, I want to thank all supporters and collaborators during the years. My family, my Luma family, all partners and colleagues around the world. Together, we are more. Our Luma story started about 20 years ago. Then it was a big need to get more motivated and talent students to universities, and also to support teachers' important work from early childhood education to universities. The first Luma Center was built at the University of Helsinki 20 years ago for promoting uh, close collaboration between schools, universities, and industry. Nowadays, we have 13 Luma centers in 11 universities and also Luma Center in China. And uh, my role has been as a catalyst, catalyzing people for close collaboration and giving opportunities for all. And we have nowadays national task from Ministry of Education and Culture and our main funding is coming from the universities and uh, from ministry. And we have a lot of project-based funding, for example, from National Board of Education, foundations, companies, and European Commission. We publish annual report every year until this uh, few million students and teachers have participated on our, our activities. Our work has been evaluated outside and it, it received a, an excellent grade. Together, we are more. Collaboration is key for success. We are building together novel activities, uh, materials, by listening makers of future and, and teachers with different partners. And uh, for example, a lot of collaboration with companies, and we have international, uh, our international collaboration is very active. For example, the schools from over 70 countries have participated on our awarded study program. And uh, we have a lot of various network uh, approach and uh, collaborating with universities. For example, I have 10 keynote talks this fall around the world and next in Africa. Luma is uh, the brand for Finnish science education. We do uh, disciplinary and multi multidisciplinary uh, learning and uh, supporting. And this uh, letter A means 
all subjects, all sciences. It's close to STEAM approach. So, for example, mathematics and arts and so on. Science belongs for all. The newest research is saying that we should start as early as possible to uh, promote science activities. And, uh, for example, we have built a lot of uh, novel activities also for little children and their families. For example, Chow Science Clubs and Virtual uh, E-Clubs. And uh, we have found that, that uh, learning through our generation is very important and relevant for makers of future. As a university network, we are promoting li uh, scientific literacy for all. For example, we know that our young people are very keen on the solutions and careers, how they can uh, do a better world in, in future. Sustainability is part of our all activities. For example, we have built International Teachers Climate Change Forum for sharing ideas and learning from each other. We have built 16 LUMA labs to different universities for close collaboration between schools, universities and industry. I started to build the first LUMA lab with uh, companies and scientists uh, uh, 15 years ago. And nowadays we have those popular LUMA labs around Finland. And they are also very popular around, uh, around the world. Many, many uh, countries want to get these kind of LUMA labs. For example, I visited South America last month and they all want to get these kind of LUMA labs. And uh, for example, we promote formal, non-formal and informal education. And uh, for example, our TikTok videos are very popular. Over one million students were uh, following our TikTok videos last year. We have built also very popular Luma Lab in computing science at Faculty of Science, University of Helsinki. They have received excellent results how to engage girls on computing science. As a university network, all our activities are research-based, and when we are uh, trying to build new innovations, activities, materials, we always start from needs and listen students' uh, voices, and together from the base of newest uh, research in science and learning, we build those pilot models together, together with our partners, and then finally we get those new innovations and then we educate teachers and, and also we study those relevancy and, and we can get scientific papers and also a lot of theses. And uh, for example, our activities are used in science centers and also some startups has uh, built on the PhD thesis. We have built also national uh, LUMAT Science Research Forum between universities, and we have international uh, journal. The quality of teacher education is a key for good, sustainable future. We have built novel programs, how to integrate formal, non-formal, and informal learning, and every teacher, as you know, effect on society about 100 years. And for example, those LUMA labs, online MOOCs, science clubs are very good and relevant environments to educate uh, new kind of teachers. We have built a lot of virtual solutions 
in education, for example, online MOOCs. We have built uh, natural sciences uh, now and in future program where, where they are free, free of cost and they are uh, free for all with uh, specialists uh, and teachers and students. And we have built over 30 MOOCs for teachers in different fields. We have also studied those relevancy of those MOOCs and published a lot of papers. Together, we have more. If you like to follow our work, you can visit our web pages or follow our social media. We have just also published the e-book. It's uh, free of cost and open for all. It's in Finnish, Swedish, and in English. And there are about 100 writers who are opening their best practices and, and materials. Thank you for this great award and this your attention, makers of future in our hearts. Together, we are more. Thank you, Maya. And thank you also for hosting the visit for me at the University of Helsinki at the Luma Center. So I had an opportunity to uh, follow teacher education and I had an opportunity to uh, visit the uh, science class there. It was really inspiring. We'll talk, still talk more about that tonight. And it was inspiring uh, to hear from Maya that uh, one teacher can affect the society for 100 years ahead. That's amazing. So we're coming to the end of the ceremony now. And let me congratulate once again all of this year's scholarship and grant receivers. I would also like to thank our foundation officers, Sami, Dr. Sami Sarpala and Mrs. Lena Tanner, for their work in the daily management of the foundation. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you who have voluntarily contributed to the Nokia Foundation. Coming back to the Nokia Foundation's mission to promote and sponsor scientific research in the field of ICT in Finland. I've, I work in the field of technology and uh, I feel that the role of technology is more important than ever for our society. We know that technology helped us out of the COVID crisis. And technology will have a major role in helping to halt the climate change. In Finland, there are initiatives at governmental level underway that will make Finland an even more attractive place to invest for technology companies and also to ensure that we, Finland, will also deploy the new pioneering technologies which can help to address the biggest challenges facing the world. Our R&D investments will need to increase to a level to match or exceed other nations around the world. And as we have heard, we must ensure the highest quality of education in technology. The Nokia Foundation is aligned with these goals, and we focus our efforts on creating a positive impact. At every funding decision, we always ask ourselves, what really matters to our society and our economy in the coming decades? How can we ensure that the knowledge created in these research programs will be used for the benefit of the society in academia, in industry, and in governmental organizations? I personally believe that the best way to transfer knowledge is to ensure the mobility of these people who have created this knowledge and to offer opportunities for them. 
At Nokia Foundation, we are interested in your thoughts on our work and what more can we do to deliver a positive impact. Please send your feedback and ideas to the Nokia Foundation. Our board will evaluate them and we'll get back to you. Thank you for following our ceremony tonight. I wish you, all of you a very successful end to the year. We will now move to the banquet hall on the first floor for the gala dinner. <laughs>